I'm a rheumatologist and, and I'm an immunologist. Um, I'm from Connecticut and we're working at Yale, so we're just one and a half hours by train away and trying to persuade you that maybe you want to get involved in some of our basic science studies with patients with lupus and antiphospholipid syndrome. All right, so I get started right away. Um, lupus is a very complex disease like any autoimmune disease and um, uh, generally speaking, genes are very important, but also immune dysregulation and the environment um, as a whole. I should mention that all the environmental factors that need to get through the body go either through the gut or the skin or the mucous membranes, and we think that the microbes that live in, in us, in the gut, may have an important role in, in, in the development of lupus. In fact, we are walking culture dishes. Um, this is just a slide showing the different parts of the gut, from the stomach down to the lower parts of the intestine. And these are all numbers it's just showing how many bacteria we actually harbor uh, throughout our gut. And it turns out um, these bacteria are not only good for metabolism, which means they digest your diet and you know, they make vitamins, but they also have immune functions, interestingly. Over the last few years, uh, several groups have shown that certain compounds in the gut produced by the bacteria can induce certain good uh, lympho immune cells or lymphocytes, thereby, thereby the smiley, but also bad lymphocytes, um, like the so-called Th17 cells. So just to illustrate, there's a, a profound effect of these microbes in your guts on immunity. Now, we think that uh, not only the gut, but what we call the barrier organs, which is uh, also the lungs and the skin, they're, they're really important to understand how uh, immune-mediated diseases evolve because, as mentioned, uh, there's not only the genes that matter that um, define all the different aspects of the immune system and the barriers, but also the environmental factors that go through the skin, the lungs, or the gut, that they may be influencing the microbes that also define our immune systems. Uh, the focus of my lab are the microbes and the gut, and um, they may be or may not be related. There's a lot of research going on right now with the rapid rise of immune-mediated diseases, including lupus. Uh, that's uh, usually known as the hygiene hypothesis. So I go right to lupus now. So lupus is very complex, as you all know. There are many different phenotypes, as we say. Some patients have more kidney disease. Others have more brain problems. Many patients have arthritis. Others have blood problems. And one uh, aspect of lupus is also the antiphospholipid syndrome, where antiphospholipid antibodies are formed, and they lead to clotting. And, and women also, they can lead to miscarriages. And these antibodies have long known to be induced transiently by infections. So we speculated that perhaps instead of an infection, someone who has chronically these antibodies, that there are microbes in your gut that could drive those. So what is the antiphospholipid syndrome? Perhaps some of you have this. Unfortunately, it's, um, oh, it's cut off here, but it is um, an autoimmune clotting disorder where patients event essentially get clotting due to the immune abnormalities. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, so patients can develop uh, deep vein thrombosis, uh, strokes, uh, heart attacks, and in women, miscarriages, as mentioned. And the, um, the problem is due to um, the um, immune system overreacting against a, um, a clotting protein called beta-2 glycoprotein 1. The pathogenesis is fairly well understood, but the cause of um, antiphospholipid syndrome is not known. Just a brief cartoon, um, the immune cells produce these antibodies to beta-2 glycoprotein 1. That's the only name maybe to remember. And then they, they bind uh, on the surface of platelets and also endothelial cells. It's just magnified here and cause a cascade of inflammation that then leads to thrombosis or fetal death. Now, the treatment, unfortunately, is archaic. We um, give patients blood thinners. And often they are unfortunately not enough, and um, also inhibiting the platelets is not working well. And a recent trial uh, trying to deplete the B cells was also not too efficacious. So we think there may be some chronic trigger, and I want to show you some early unpublished data that is funded by the Lupus Research Institute um, that we think microbiota, these microbes in your gut, at least in an animal model, drive the syndrome. So we have this mouse model where these mice develop heart attacks, lung clots, and, and strokes, just like some patients. Um, and they also develop lupus, but they die from these clotting problems. And remarkably, when we remove all microbes in the gut of these animals, uh, we essentially have no disease anymore. We really prevented them from dying. 
And that's the survival curve, so um, uh, telling the postdoc in the last, Silvio made these uh, studies. Um, these mice that uh, are not treated with antibiotics, they, they, most of them die within several weeks from clotting, uh, while interestingly, uh, just one single antibiotic, vancomycin, or another antibiotic, ampicillin, which uh, especially vancomycin, only acts in the gut on those microbes, it completely prevented the disease uh, to occur. And it also reduced the so-called bad antibodies, the autoantibodies against this beta-2 glycoprotein-1. I'll just go quickly through this, but essentially across time, as these mice age and get higher and higher titers of these bad antibodies, uh, these antibiotics could prevent uh, the formation of them. And what we're currently doing, this is work in progress, we looked at the microbes in the gut uh, of, of, of co colonies of mice from uh, mice that were treated with these different antibiotics. And the goal is to culture them and put them into other mice that don't have any microbes. They're so-called germ-free mice. And that's uh, all in progress, but we're trying to identify which are the key bad microbes that may be driving these antibodies in, in these mice. We also study patients. This is not part of the LRI-funded research, but an NIH-funded R01 project. But uh, just to let you know, we are very interested in, in also patient samples. And we, we asked uh, the question, could um, these autoantibodies against this uh, clotting protein also occur in the stool? So we looked for fecal autoantibodies. And indeed, um, a graduate student in the lab, Bill Ruff, he was able to show that there is formation of antibodies even in the stool, again, making the link closer between the gut and the systemic autoimmune disease. And we also have a technology that we adapted from a colleague of us at Yale where you can look if uh, these antibodies, not the same, but uh, antibodies in general, are coding certain bacteria in the gut, and then we're trying to make the link. And I'll stop here. All I'm saying is we have a big uh, research agenda also on the patients with antiphospholipid syndrome and lupus. The challenge in human patients is that the microbiome is really what we call microbiome, the gut microbes that live in you, they're really very variable, and that's best illustrated in newborns. When you look at a baby from uh, born, the day they're born to about two years, one investigator studied almost every other day the, the mi microbes in the gut of these babies. And interestingly, as you can see here, for instance, when they went from breastfeeding to formula diet, you can see by the different color, the different colors just show you the different microbes, there's a profound change. So of course these studies in humans are hard to do because we need to know your diet, we need to know your medications and how they could influence um, your microbes. I think this is also an opportunity because we think that certain diets may actually be maybe helping your lupus. This is speculation, but we think that these microbes from one state can go into another state uh, depending on how we influence them with diet. So one aspect of the LRI funded research is to also look if diet can alter uh, lupus. And um, the, the hypothesis is that the usual diet, again in animals, uh, the mouse diet that our mice get, may drive these bad microbes that produce these bad lymphocytes producing bad antibodies that then leads to heart attacks, stro strokes, and lungs, lung clots. And we are testing certain diets and speculate that this may lead to abrogation of this um, cascade. And just to show you one very uh, early data. This is not from the model I showed you earlier, but we also have a model where the mice uh, die from lupus. And we indeed, with a certain starch diet, which was done by Martina, an Italian in the lab, um, could really prevent, uh, to some degree, uh, quite significantly, the mortality from lupus. And this is, is really early work, so don't change your diets. This is all still very early, but we are excited about that. We're looking at the microbes now in those mice, and in the different groups, as you see by the different colors, before we start the, the new diet, they're all very similar. And then just very quickly, I show you how the, over time, how the diets, there are three different diets, how they change the composition of those microbes in the gut. And I'll, I'll, I'll stop here just to summarize. We're trying to find certain influences on the microbes in the gut, like the diet, and you'll hear later a talk from another uh, outstanding investigator who's looking at the hormones and how they influence the microbes, and that this uh, changes the balance between bad and good microbes, and that in the end, if you have also the wrong genes, may influence if you get a disease or not. And I'm listed here in a review we recently wrote just the most obvious diseases that are likely driven by those microbes, and these are those where the microbes live on. For instance, in the gut, where a lot of microbes are, inflammatory bowel disease, we think, is occurring this way. Psoriasis, a skin autoimmune disease, may be involved uh, by this pathway. And then we're speculating on lung disease as well. But I hope to have shown you some early data that we think that lupus and antiphospholipid syndrome may also be influenced by your microbes. 
So in summary, I've told you uh, we are walking culture dishes. Um, gut microbes affect various immune functions. Um, antiphospholipid syndrome is a clotting uh, autoimmune disorder associated frequently with lupus. Um, APS is prevented with certain antibiotics, at least in the animal model. And lupus is mitigated with a diet that changes the microbiome. And lastly, and most importantly, I want to thank the members of my team. I, I named everyone as I went along. Um, if you want to hear more about our research, we have a little YouTube video. If you go to Kriegel Autoimmunity on YouTube. But more importantly, I want to point out we, we're doing some very early basic microbiome studies in patients with antiphospholipid syndrome and lupus. And uh, if you're interested, and I know it's Connecticut and not New York, but we have some patients from New York, um, let us know. We have two study coordinators working on that. And we also have a collaborator in New York, Doruk Erkan, at the Hospital for Special Surgery. He's a pure clinician, but he sends us stool and blood samples from his patients to Yale. Um, with that, uh, I just want to thank again very much the Lupus Research Institute for funding us. And some work I showed you was funded by the National Institute of Health. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Martin Kriegel. Michelle Kosowitz, PhD. Why are men more protected from lupus, and can the reason lead to new therapies? Okay, so I'm going to talk. I'm from the University of Louisville. I am a PhD scientist, and I'm, I am an immunologist. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about hormones. As you all know, I'm sure, uh, lupus is is a, a, a very, women are at much higher risk of developing lupus than men are, so there's a really strong gender bias there, nine to one. A 90 percent of all, of all patients uh, who have lupus are women. Uh, so the question is, why are women at much greater risk? Or uh, the alternative question, which is what we're interested in, it's a little bit uh, opposite, um, because we think we can utilize that information to maybe help patients with lupus. Uh, why are men at much lower risk? risk of developing lupus. So this is the question that we um, addressed. I'm not going to uh, talk a lot about uh, the preliminary information I was going to talk to you about, because Dr. Krager already did that. Fortunately, he already laid the groundwork. So when the hook comes out, um, I, I hopefully will have, been fin I'll have finished. But as you know, that there are, ge there are genetic basis as well as immune regulation and environment. Dr. Krager had mentioned that already, that impact and determine whether or not you develop lupus. So just a little bit of a primer here. Um, sex steroids are, um, are involved in immune response. We know that the female sex steroids, the estrogens, including estradiol, um, are, uh, pro do exacerbate disease. Uh, they're generally immunoenhancive. That means that they increase the immune response. They don't decrease the immune response. And many cells in the immune system have receptors for estrogens. So that means that the impact can be on many different cells in the immune system. Androgens, which are the male sex steroids, and, the, and um, testosterone is one of those. Um, and again, there are receptors on all immune cells in the, in the, in the immune system that, uh, that can be responsive to androgens. And they generally are immunosuppressive. So the simplest um, answer to this is that the sex steroids that women have, estrogens, are immunoenhancive, and so you're actually creating too much of an immune response, whereas men have androgens that are immunosuppressive, so they suppress immune response. It's not that simple. Uh, if it was, life would be much easier to deal with. So just again, in general, um, uh, the estrogens or the sex steroids, pregnancy can exacerbate, as some of you may know, increase complications and flares, uh, exposure to estrogens either in the form of uh, oral contraceptives, hormone replacement, even in fertilizer, insecticides, you know, um, estrogenic compounds you can find in the environment can all potentially exacerbate disease, theoretically. Um, androgens, we know that androgen levels correlate inversely with disease activity, so women do produce some levels of androgens. And if you see a flare, when you see a flare, generally the androgens are lower, so that's called an inverse relationship. Uh, female and male lupus patients on a, tend to have lower levels than androgens than, than non-lupus patients, and we know that people with Kleinfelters, those are men with Kleinfelters, have an XX. Again, they have lower levels of androgens and a higher susceptibility to uh, higher incidence of, of uh, lupus. Um, and chances are uh, patients probably do metabolize androgens differently. Uh, and we know um, in, in mouse models, and, uh, and forgive me because I'm going to talk about mice today, <laughs> so, uh, and you're probably going to be happy that this isn't being done in humans yet, so just uh, bear with me. 
Um, we know that if you castrate males, so if you remove the source of testosterone in, in models of, of lupus, that males develop disease. So they don't even have to have estrogens. It's just good enough to be able to eliminate those androgens and they get disease. Um, and if you treat females with testosterone, not something that I would recommend for females because the side effects are not good. Very, 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 um, very strong, very uh, negative side effects. Uh, you can actually prevent disease in female mice. And this is just our model, our animal model of lupus, an ex exceptionally good model for lupus, except that they are mice. Um, they, they, and this is, uh, this is just uh, an age. So this, they do get autoantibodies, double-stranded DNA antibodies, all the same antibodies that uh, human patients get. And this is, a this is a mouse model of glomerular nephritis, so nephritis, so kidney disease, and they do get kidney disease. So in blue, you have the males. They don't get disease. The females are the only ones that get disease in this model. And you can see survival. So the females, in this model anyway, um, have survival issues. And this is just uh, information telling you that in this model, if you, when you castrate males, they start developing autoantibodies just like females. And if you treat females with testosterone, they get, don't get disease. So again, you know, this is a very complex disease. That's why it's been so difficult to develop drugs or any kind of treatment for lupus. Uh, so I'm going to focus on, because my lab works on immunoregulation, how the immune response is regulated and the interaction with the environment, which we consider hormones to be part of the environment, in a sense. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about, these are the happy cells. You know, Dr. Krager had um, T-regs, and next to it he had a happy face. So these are cells that suppress the immune system. They control the immune system. They're a special type of white blood cell leukocyte that regulates or suppresses other cells when necessary, okay? So in, if, in um, people who have who have different autoimmune diseases have defects in these cells. So these cells are really important. If we can get these cells to be functional and to get more of them, that would be a really good thing and we can control autoimmune disease, but it's very difficult to do that. Uh, these cells are made in several locations and they can be actually made by other kinds of immune cells. And I'm telling you that for a reason. Now, your eyes are probably gonna glaze over when I start talking to you about the data, but look at the top of each of these slides and it's actually the take home message, okay? So for example here, um, these are Tregs, and they're about, in our animal model, females have about 25, sometimes as much as 50% fewer of these regulatory cells than, than male mice do. And these are uh, a special kind of regulatory cell that are induced in the, so they're made by those other immune cells I was telling you about. So females do not make regulatory cells in this model as well as males do. And that's going to be an important issue, okay? I won't go into the GI tract because we're going to talk about the GI tract a little bit and why that's important for, uh, for this system that I'm telling you about. Uh, Dr. Krager already told you about all the different parts. So this is, if you, take, if you take the colon or the intestine, stretch it out like a hose and cut it, the inside of that hose is where um, pre-poo pre is formed, basically. It's where the bacteria live, and it's where you digest the food, okay? So that is, uh, whoop, sorry, that is here. So this is the internal. This is a cross-section. This is the cell layer that, dis, did, that divides, that separates you from everything that's, whoops, sorry. Ooh, ooh, a little bit too much caffeine. Okay, so... Um, and these are the cells that we're interested in. They're actually embedded in the wall of the intestine on the inside, not the outside where the bacteria are. And these are cells whose job it is to make regulatory T cells, these Tregs. That's one of the jobs that they have. That's these guys right here, okay? These are the cells that we're interested in. And in this experiment, what we did is we asked how well those cells make, those regulatory cells that we want to make. Um, how, and we compared them between males and females, and we found, and my graduate student always tells me, tell everybody it took her two years to do this experiment, okay? So it's a very long experiment and uh, very energy uh, intensive. Females, these female mice just don't do it as well as males do, okay? They just don't make the regulatory cells as well. And this is another experiment uh, that confirms that. If we castrate males, if we remove the androgens from the males so that they don't produce testosterone, they look very similar. So even though these dots don't look the same, these are bars, they do not produce, so if you castrate males, they do not produce regulatory cells. So they look a lot like a female. 
basically. So we know that androgens are important in making these Tregs, in, in making these cells. Again, don't let your eyes glaze over here. These are gene expression assays. And so what we wanted to know is what was the difference between the female and the male cells that made those female cells not very good at making T regulatory cells. And we found a gene that, that was defective in those females. Okay, so just keep in mind the word, the phrase retinoic acid. Okay, remember that. That's a, a, a molecule that's made from vitamin A. Okay, really important molecule. If these cells don't produce that molecule, they cannot induce regulatory T cells. Okay, so remember that. Okay, so just the summary and conclusions of this part. Uh, in general, normal numbers and function of regulatory T cells or Tregs are required to prevent and to control autoimmune disease. Okay, we know that that's true for all autoimmune diseases, including lupus. Uh, females and castrated males that have, you know, they have low or no androgen are at higher risk of developing lupus. We know that that's true. Uh, female and castrated males have lower numbers of Tregs. Okay, so that kind of makes sense, right? Uh, the immune cells that help make those T regulatory cells are defective in both female as well as castrated males, suggesting that it's the androgens that are probably controlling the function of those cells. Okay. Um, and we think that this maybe this defect is due to inadequate levels of retinoic acid being produced. Again, remember that retinoic acid. So strategies that can increase the ability of those cells to make regulatory T cells or produce retinoic acid might be very effective therapies for the prevention or, and or the treatment of lupus. Okay, you with me so far? Ish, right? Okay, this is just a pretty picture. This is, so now we're gonna talk about microbiota. So I'm on that other investigator that he mentioned. It's like, okay, so what does that have to do with anything we're talking about? So all of those cells that we said are involved in making Tregs are in the gut. So they're going to be exposed to the bacteria that are in your gut. So, um, and the gut, and I'm not gonna go over this, you have trillions of these little bugs in your gut. I mean, trillions of them. And they're good, and they're good bugs by and large, as long as you don't have some sort of odd disease. And there are thousands of different kinds, but there are trillions of these guys. They way outweigh the number of cells you have in your body. You just have lots of them. So they have a huge impact on many, many functions in the body. And this is just this complicated picture here, all the different things that the microbiota in your gut do, okay? Uh, they're involved in producing vitamins. They're, they break down non-digestible uh, fiber, metabolize complex carbohydrates, they synthesize amino acids. I mean, they do all kinds of things. What we're interested in is they are also required for the normal development of the immune system and immunoregulation. Okay, if you don't have normal microbiota, you're not going to develop a no normal immune system, and you can create that can create problems. So that was our that's the tie-in. Oops. Okay, this is just a pretty picture that one of our graduate students painted, and this is of the gut that I can't resist. So this is the gut, these are the bacteria. This is the inside of the gut. This is the bacterial wall that we showed about. So these are the cells that we're interested in. These are the ones, I know they kind of look like creepy crawly things, right? So, but these are the cells that actually induce the regulatory T cells, okay? Um, and we think that these have an impact on autoimmunity. Oops. So. The gut microbiota and disease. Now we know the gut microbiota has a huge impact on, on diseases that are, are at different places in the body, not just in the gut. Uh, response to, to viruses, uh, uh, issues with the nervous system, uh, development of immune systems I've mentioned already, uh, hepatic disease, type 1 diabetes, obesity, um, inflammatory bowel disease, of course, and we think uh, autoimmune arthritis, and we think that it also has an impact on lupus. Okay, there was a recent paper, and this is what made us actually go after these kinds of, um, do these kinds of experiments, so to speak. So apparently, there's a relationship between gender, between sex, between the gut microbiota and autoimmune disease. And this was originally discovered in type 1 diabetes, but we wanted to see if there was a relationship in lupus, because in type 1 diabetes, there is no gender difference like there is in lupus. So... We asked the question, does gender affect the types of microorganisms in the, in the gut of lupus-prone mice? Okay, and the answer is yes. So male mice have a significantly different composition 
of microbiota than female mice do. We don't know if this is true in humans. We'd love to do the experiment. We'd love to do those studies. Those are, in the future, these are all preliminary studies. So it is definitely the case in adult mice, they have, males have definitely a different composition. Okay, so the next question is, okay, different composition. What happens if we take uh, basically the feces, it's the microbiota from males, and give it to females? Transfer that microbiota in. And so what we find, so we give it to in what I would call a, a mouse that's at the tween age, okay? Peripubert around the time of puberty, so we start feeding them at that time. Uh, and we give it to them monthly, and we do feed the feces. Basically, we give them, we call it a poo shake. And it is cecum, and it contains microbiota. It contains the microbiota, okay? It contains the, the actual bacteria from the males. Uh, if we feed female uh, fe uh, cecum, cecal contents, microbiota, you can see that they start developing autoantibodies. This is the normal trajectory, the normal time course of, of this in this model. However, if we feed male feces to these females, we can actually significantly suppress disease. This model is very, very difficult to treat. It's very difficult to prevent disease in this model. You have to give them massive doses of steroids. This is a remarkable um, prevention. I mean, it really is. And this is the nephritis, so kidney disease is dramatically suppressed in these animals as well. And survival is really dramatically suppressed, in these, um, increased, sorry. Mortality is suppressed, uh, survival is, is definitely increased. This is just by feeding microbiota. So the question then is, oh, if we give the reverse, if we, so that's if we give male feces and give it to females, what happens when we give female feces and give it to males? Does that mean we get, they get disease? And the answer is no. They don't get disease. So if you give the female microbiota, so in this model system in lupus, it does not help to treat with antibiotics, okay? Antibiotics do not do anything for lupus. It does not prevent lupus in females. It does not help lupus at all in this system, okay? So in this system, the male microbiota are protective. It's not the microbiota itself that are causing disease, but the males are producing something that makes them protect, be protected from lupus, okay? So if we then, remember those cells I was telling you about that are involved in inducing T regulatory cells? If we feed the feces and then look at those cells in females, I know it's hard to tell, but just take it from me, those cells are now able to induce regulatory T cells, make regulatory T cells in response to being fed the, the male flora, okay? Uh, and again, the T regs go up, okay? By feeding male flora, male microbiota into the females, we can actually make the regulatory cells go up. Oop. Okay, so then the question is, what about fecal transplantation? It probably doesn't sound too appealing, but it's a possibility. We now know that you can, their fecal transplants are being given to different kinds of patients for different diseases. Uh, people who have antibiotic-resistant Clostridium difficile infection who are very, very sick and resistant to any kind of treatment have literally been saved by being given a, a transplantation. But that's an entirely different situation. That's, a, that's an intestinal infection. Uh, there are clinical trials for ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, which are form of inflammatory bowel diseases uh, and irritable bowel syndrome. Those are in clinical trials. We have no idea what the potential is for the treatment of autoimmune disease in humans. We just don't know that. There are cautions that we have to think about if you do transplants. Uh, whose stool do you use, right? <laughs> what does it contain, right? You know, what does it have? What does it contain? So one person's stool might be okay for one person, but not for another. So we just don't know enough about that. There's too much in, in the stool. There's too many different things that can, that can happen that we just don't know how that can help. So it could exacerbate symptoms or cause other pathologies or complications. So this is a possibility in the future, but it's very complicated and it's very difficult to do that. So what we did is we asked, okay, so if we don't know what the bugs are, which we're, we have a, 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 an NIH R01 to look at the actual uh, microbiota itself, but in, for this, for the ALR, for the Alliance for Lupus Research, um, the funding there is we want to look at the function of the microbiota. So what are the microbiota producing? What are they producing? Because that'd be a lot easier if they're producing something they can just, 
you know, feed rather than um, having to figure out what to give them. The microbiota produce lots of different things, okay? These are all the different categories of, of molecules that the microbiota produce in general. Uh oh, am I about to get dragged off? But this is my, oh, sorry, I didn't even see my sign. Sorry about that. So this is just the take home message there, and this is just a, a schematic of that. We think, we, this is probably not the only metabolite, but our ongoing research, uh, we're going to be, we're treating right now with Phytol, okay, and we have some preliminary results that are promising. We have uh, another analysis coming up where we're looking for other metabolites that we might be able to create a cocktail for treatment, possibly. Um, and we also want to identify the mechanisms and the cells that are involved. And these are the people. Uh, most of this work was done by Anita Shabra, a very talented graduate student in the lab. And thank you very much, and sorry for going over time. <laughs> Dr. Michael Stein, thank you so very much. He's going to be talking about can reducing dietary salt alleviate lupus symptoms. So, so I'm a rheumatologist, but I've, I've always been interested in heart disease. And I never really thought much about salt in, when I was wearing my lupus hat. And when I was wearing my heart disease hat, I would tell all my patients with their high blood pressure, you know, don't eat too much salt, follow the American Heart Guidelines. And then I learned some things from a, a wonderful investigator called Jens Tietze, who's a co-investigator on this project, that really made me think very differently about salt. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about, about um, what he discovered. And Dr. Tietze is, is a driven man, I think is the easiest way to describe him. So he did not believe anything he was taught by any of his teachers, and he still doesn't. And, and he's a nephrologist, and he was taught that when you eat salt every day, the amount of salt you eat comes out in your urine. So your body is always in perfect salt balance. And that's pretty much been the, the physiological teaching for, for decades. And you can imagine why that's true, because if it wasn't true, you'd swell up like a balloon. You know, you have to get rid of the salt because salt holds water, and if you don't get rid of the salt, you'll, you'll pop. You'll become a Michelin person and, and, and pop. And, and he said, you know, let, let's look at this carefully. No one's ever really tested this hypothesis. And he thought, where, where can I do this? How can I get people and feed them an exact amount of salt, sodium, and measure every drop of urine that comes out of them and, and measure this, this hypothesis. And he, he ended up testing spacemen who were training for a mission to Mars. So these were Russian spacemen, and they were locked in a capsule, uh, just like they were going to go to Mars. They didn't go out for months. Every bit of food that went into the capsule, the exact contents was known. Every drop of everything that came out of the capsule was measured. So this was a very, very controlled uh, experiment. He made a deal with, I think it was the Russian government, where he supplied the food for the spacemen for six months or whatever it was. And in exchange, he could, he could do some of these scientific experiments. So this is, this is some of the data just from, from one person, but it represents what happens uh, in, in all of them. And the black line over here really represents the, the line of zero, where that's the diet that the person's taking in, and it's just a constant diet. So there's no variability in the sodium in, in the person's diet. The, the red dots and the red lines represent the amount of sodium coming out in the urine each day over this period of time. And you can see if everything was in balance, those lines would overlap completely. But they're not in balance. What happens is that there's a rhythm of, of salt where sometimes it's too high and sometimes it's too low. And those amounts, you might think 100 uh, um, millimoles is not a whole lot of sodium, but that's often all that a person would eat in a day. So, so that's a fair amount of sodium. He didn't really understand this, but he, he, he thought about it some, and he, he asked the question, well, you know, if, if the body's holding on to sodium, it must be somewhere. It can't be floating around in the ether. It must be somewhere in the body. So what he did was he took animals and he fed them sodium, and then he, he burnt them. So he dissected them up, and he burnt different parts of the, the animal to see where the sodium was. And he found out that most of the sodium was in the skin or in the muscle. And then he said, well, you know, I like to work with humans, and I can't burn humans to find out where, where, the, where the sodium is, but I can measure sodium in humans. So he developed an MRI technique, which is the same sort of MRI that, that some of you might have seen or had, or had um, 
relatives uh, go through, but it uses a sodium sensor rather than the usual kind of uh, sensor used in the, in, the, in the MRI. And what he did was he put, this, uh, he put people into the sodium MRI and he found out that the sodium shown here in white is really just below the skin, just as he'd found in the animals. These, these little tubes here are tubes of salt water, just with different concentrations, increasing concentrations, more salt equals more white. So that's used to, to grade the amount of sodium in the MRI. There's two scans here. The one on the left is a, is a young person who did not have high blood pressure. The one on the right is an older person who did have high blood pressure. And it's really to summarize some of his data, which suggests that as we age, we tend to get more sodium in our tissues. We hold on to sodium. And also, if we have high blood pressure, we tend to hold on to sodium in the tissues. So he, he then, he's such a clever guy. He said, well, I don't really understand this. And, and you know, somehow we were made to have sodium in the skin. And, and what's it doing there? Um, and to summarize a whole lot of experiments that he did, he figured out that the sodium there is acting to activate the immune system. So it's actually a barrier to stop your skin getting infected by bacteria. And this is a scan of a, of a man who had an infection in his one leg. And you can see the massive amount of sodium in white there. And his other uninfected leg on, on the other side has virtually no sodium in it at all. And so what turns out was that the sodium that's in the skin not only has beneficial effects on the immune system where it stimulates the body to fight infection, but unfortunately it also appears to have detrimental effects on the immune system. And he showed this in an animal model of autoimmune disease, which is called the EAE model, Experimental Autoimmune Encephalitis. I have trouble saying it, I can't, I can't remember it. But it's an it's a autoimmune disease which is similar to multiple sclerosis, and it's a well-used model of, of autoimmune disease. And basically, they fed uh, the animals either a high-salt diet or a low-salt diet. And you can see that the, the, uh, the animals on the low-salt or the control diet did pretty well, and those on the high-salt diet uh, got, got worse disease. So this suggested that the, the high-sodium intake was exacerbating autoimmune disease. There are another couple of models that have also shown this, including an arthritis model. So he, these are some of the studies he did showing that the high skin sodium is associated with high blood pressure. This is women with high blood pressure on, on this side here in the red. This is their skin sodium on the MRI. And you can see the women in, in red have a higher skin sodium than control women who have normal blood pressure. And if you just take all men and women and you plot the height of their blood pressure against the amount of skin sodium, the higher your skin sodium, the higher your blood pressure tends to be. So as a rheumatologist, I put on my rheumatologist hat and thought, well, you know, patients with lupus have increased cardiovascular disease. Uh, Dr. Tsitsi is telling me that perhaps salt uh, has something to do with exacerbation of autoimmune disease in animals. Uh, perhaps we can study uh, uh, this in patients with lupus. And the reason we became interested in, in cardiovascular disease is some very old data. And this shows the coronary calcium, which is a scan of the heart looking at the amount of atherosclerosis. And it was one of the first studies that showed in young women with lupus, there's much more coronary calcium at every age group. The patients in lupus are in the dark bars, the controls are in the light bars, and these are the age groups uh, on the bottom. So we started to think, well, perhaps we could test some of these uh, ideas in, in patients, and we went to the literature and said, well, look, what do we know about salt in, in lupus? And um, there, there was that. There's absolutely no, no information whatsoever uh, in patients with lupus, not even how much they eat. Uh, we looked at our cohort of patients that we have and did a very crude estimate of their sodium intake, and it's about the same as the, as the rest of the US population was about 10 grams a day, which is, which is more, much more than is recommended for, for all of us. So we, we, we're asking two questions in this, uh, in this project that's funded by the Lupus Research Institute. Uh, the first one is a very simple one. We're just going to measure the skin sodium by MRI in patients with lupus and in matched controls and ask whether the skin sodium is higher in patients with lupus or not. 
And our second question is, we're going to ask whether a change in the sodium diet will affect the skin sodium and will also affect inflammation and blood pressure in patients with lupus. So high blood pressure is, is a very common problem in patients with lupus, and uh, it's therefore important to know what the salt diet does to that. These are some of the things we're doing. So we're measuring the sodium MRI. We're going to measure some of the inflammatory markers. We're going to measure blood pressure and some other kind of fancy blood vessel tests. And then we're going to apply those to, to the two questions we're, we're asking. Uh, each diet, the high salt and low salt, will be for about four weeks with a washout of four weeks in between. And this is just an example of the 24-hour blood pressure. If any of you have ever had it done, it's kind of quite exciting. Uh, I've worn one of these. It's kind of fun to see your, see your tracing. But you can get a tremendous amount of information over 24 hours in terms of what's happening to the blood pressure. One of the things we're particularly interested in is blood pressure at night. Most of us drop our blood pressure at night. Some of us don't. And if you don't drop your blood pressure at night, uh, it tends to have a worse outcome in terms of cardiovascular disease. So that's something we're, we're going to be looking at as well. So I'm going to stop there and, and, st and stop and just summarize quickly. So Dr. Tsitsi showed animal models increased sodium stores can drive autoimmune disease. Uh, he showed that in humans you can measure sodium stores by the sodium MRI. And he showed that there's increased skin sodium uh, is associated with high blood pressure and inflammation. And we're going to uh, bring you some data in about 18 months that will give you some of the answers to all of the questions I'm sure you want to ask. Thank you. Next, we have Amory Grammer, PhD, repurposing existing drugs for lupus and update. Thank you. So I'm here to talk today about a project that's been going on for about two years. Wonderful cooperative success of the ALR and the LRI. I like to start out with this cartoon, which a friend of mine who's a graphic artist made. So someone looking at a computer, and it's sort of the essence of what I'm talking about today. And that's finding drugs that have been approved for one disease and see if they'll work for lupus. So a scientist is here thinking about a drug that works for cancer to see if it will fight lupus too. So I wanted to introduce myself. I'm a PhD scientist. I've always worked with human cells for my entire life in close collaboration with physicians. So I used to do experiments myself in the laboratory, and now I analyze things by computer. And I've been working with Peter Lipsky and the ALR and the LRI on the drug repositioning effort. Some of you may know it by LRXL stat, and we have a wonderful LinkedIn site. Many of you are participants in it. We have over 1,200 members now. So just briefly, I'm sure all of you know this, is lupus is a really multifaceted disease. And that's very important for what I'm going to talk about today. One drug very rarely is going to fit for all lupus patients. Some patients have severe kidney disease. Some patients have skin disease. Some patients have problems with their heart or lung. So it's a very important thing that I keep in mind all the time when I'm looking for new drugs to use for lupus patients. One shoe does not fit every person. And we, I have to keep that in mind. And the goal is to try to find drugs that can be repurposed for all of these various subtypes of lupus as those that may work for everybody. So it's just a very important thing to keep in mind. So as you all know, lupus, unfortunately, mostly affects women and minorities. We're just talking about African Americans, but also Hispanics and Asian populations. And despite the need for new treatments, as I'm sure you all are very painfully aware, there's only been one new drug approved for lupus in the past 50 years. And that was really the stimulus for a lot of groups, including the ALR and the LRI, to really drive forward this project to try to see if we could find an alternative way to find new drugs. This is a slide from a paper that came out a couple of years ago, but I'll use it just to illustrate a very important point, is that pharma, and even I was shocked as a scientist to actually see the real numbers, pharma usually take over 13 years and almost $2 billion to make a brand new drug. And usually it's only successful about 10% uh, of the time. So there are a lot of reasons for that. 
Science is difficult. It's hard to predict from working animal models to human. Most of the time, it's the same. Many times, it's different. But I think it's very important to keep in mind when we're thinking about this and see the value of alternative ways to try to think about finding new treatments for lupus. So I have a friend who's an artist who's made some of these pictures for me. And I just want to illustrate some of the different steps that we've taken along the way to get to repurposing drugs in lupus. And if many of you are members of the LRXL Stat LinkedIn site, I appreciate your participation and all of your suggestions. I'd love for all of you to link in with me. So started out trying to find drugs that could be possible candidates to repurpose. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. We've gotten to the point that we've kicked off some trials. STAT, we wanted to do it quickly, SLE treatment acceleration trials. And we now have a functional lupus clinical investigator network called Loop Lucin that will actually um, make these trials happen at universities and medical centers and private physicians all over the United States. So we're at a very exciting time. Uh, and it's been moving very quickly. When I was here a year ago, I was telling you about the LRXL stat list. But now we actually have some trials going, which is very exciting. So LRXL stat, or lupus drug repositioning, was initiated by the LRI and the ALR to address the very slow pace of development, which I just mentioned, of new SLE therapies. And the focus was laser beam focus on very quickly trying to identify potential drugs that might work for lupus patients. So I just wanted to very briefly, and I didn't even really understand what drug repositioning was when I started, to just go over what does that mean. People use a lot of words, drug repurposing, drug repositioning, just moving it from one disease to another disease, retooling a drug, using the same drug for another purpose, um, or reprofiling, retasking. It all means the same thing. So what really is repositioning? So in the first step, we were looking for drugs that have been approved by the FDA, meaning that they're already out there. A physician can write a prescription for them at any time, but may be good candidates for lupus patients and could be tested in a safe way. And just some examples that you might be familiar with, Rogaine, um, is now used for hair loss. It was developed for hypertensive. Viagra was developed for blood pressure, used for a much different purpose now. Um, Lyrica and Requip. So these are all examples of successful repurposing. So we're not trying to do something entirely new. And even when you're thinking about that, most of the drugs that are used in lupus actually really are repurposed drugs, um, so, such as mycophenolate, cytoxan, azathioprine, methotrexate, and rituximab. So this isn't a, a new concept. So this is a slide I showed before, just to bring home the point, it costs a lot of money to develop drugs in pharma. We want to capitalize on what's out there and try to very rapidly bring some new drug candidates to lupus patients. So how do we do this? So uh, through some of my friends and colleagues, they suggested social media. I'd never done it before, and it's been wildly successful. That's the LinkedIn site. We got suggestions from patients, physicians, researchers, and we looked at them all. We also searched the entire database of all drugs that have been approved by the FDA with our knowledge of mechanism of what we know about lupus. We could make some hypotheses of ones that might be nearer top of the list than others. Um, the ALR and the LRI convened a group of experts in a vetting committee to look at all the agents. And we especially looked at things that have been used in mirroring models of lupus that some of the speakers talked about earlier. So just very briefly, the main point to this slide is we did this in a very methodical way the same for every single drug. There was no emotional bias, no political bias, so that every suggestion was evaluated in exactly the same way. And these are some of the points. How safe are they? Does it make sense? And to actually look in the literature and see if anybody had have ever looked at it before. 
either in a mouse or cells that were taken from a patient, or maybe a case report, a physician tried something with the patient, and it may have worked, and he may have published it. So this is the most exciting slide that I want to show you today, and this is our list of high-priority candidates um, that we're looking at repositioning into lupus. One of them I'm going to talk about in a minute, Ustekinumab, which got a score of 10. It's a biologic. Um, already approved. It's a drug with Janssen. All the rest of the drugs in red are things um, that were suggested and evaluated sort of in the first half of the process. The things in purple are drugs that were either approved over the last year, because this is an ongoing process. I'm always looking at new drugs that are approved to see if they'd work for lupus patients, as well as working with companies to see whether they have something in development, some intellectual property that we can work with them to convince them to take it into lupus. So there are lots of fabulous, fabulous candidates, and I'll just tell you briefly about the trials that are gonna be happening pretty quickly here. So the highest scoring biologic, so that's a new generation drug, it's a smart bullet, it's an antibody, usually has very few side effects, because it gets one thing and one thing only, and that's what it was made to target. So this was a drug that was made to treat psoriasis, it's owned by Janssen. Um, but the mechanism of action made sense in lupus, the target made sense in lupus. So a group from the ALR and the LRI approached Janssen, sort of had an amazing meeting with them, met with their top scientists and then with other people almost two years ago and talked about planning, let's just do a small trial, see if it works in lupus patients. There was a press release last spring, the investigator meeting actually happened last month, and the first patient will be enrolled momentarily. So this is a, a great success, and the first trial of this drug repositioning effort that's moving forward. Just briefly, two, uh, two other things that I wanted to mention. Uh, this is something that's near and dear to my heart. In Time Magazine last year, the mindful revolution. So meditation, mindfulness, our state of mind, our psychology affects our hormones. It affects the neurotransmitters in our brain. It affects our biology. We all know that. As a student, I would run myself down. I would study too much. I would end up getting sick right after exams. We all kind of know this in our heart. Um, and people over the last five or six years have started to approach this technique from a scientific standpoint as well. And about a year ago, I was out at Stanford doing some meta-analysis, meaning I'm trying to look for genes that I can target with a drug. Somebody had a lot of data from mindfulness. I collected two other studies, and I compared the genes that changed either with yoga or curtain kriya meditation or with some other forms of apasana meditation, lo and behold, some of the genes that are abnormally up or down in lupus patients actually change in the opposite direction with meditation and mindfulness techniques. So this is being seriously considered. Um, it's gonna be developed in close uh, concert with patient focus groups to make sure that the approach is something that people can incorporate in their daily lives. The current Korea method that was developed at UCLA, it's a 12-minute meditation. You can find it right now on YouTube. You know, sometimes we all put things off, but I think we can all find 12 minutes in the day uh, to try to help uh, make us feel better. And the goal is to get a prolonged benefit in well-being, but also in disease activity. We wouldn't be looking at this seriously if there wasn't evidence that meditation and mindfulness actually affected disease activity. So um, the ALR and the LRI had an expert meeting last year, and there's hope that a trial will begin in 2016. Those are the two big trials I wanted to talk about, and then briefly touch upon another very important aspect of this whole project, which is the involvement of patients, patients like you. People are calling this many different names, but the simple name is just a lupus patient network. Um, it's a program that's based on one that Peter Lipsky developed in rheumatoid arthritis. It has over a 20-year track record. 
Uh, there are patient educators in the network for rheumatoid arthritis all over the world today. And the idea is to take the lessons learned from that network and to utilize that in lupus and to do this in partnership with the trials that will be going on with lupus drug group positioning. The idea is to have patient volunteers from every site um, to vet them, have them recommended by their peers, go through an evaluation process, participate in formal training about the disease, how to recognize the disease, how to teach other patients to recognize the disease and all of the symptoms, and to interact with patients about lupus and participate in clinical trials and provide support. So you'll hear much more about that over the next three or four months, but I just wanted to plant that idea in your mind. So to wrap up, I just want to emphasize again something I've learned, the role of social media. So we have a great LinkedIn site for the Lupus Drug Repurposing Initiative. I hope you all go there. That's the website. You can just put in LRXL stat into Google. It will come up. I have cards. I'm happy to give them to you afterwards. Um, we have over 1,200 members. And the most exciting thing is it's generated over 101 different drug suggestions. 16 of those came from patients, and we've looked at every single one of them. So I hope to see you on that site. So in conclusion, the lupus drug repositioning effort is ongoing. It's been very successful. We actually have some trials going, and it really looks like it may accelerate the development of new treatments for lupus. So I'd like to thank all who provided ideas, suggestions, and critiques. This is a rolling process. I depend upon all of you to interact, help us make this better and better. To the ALR and the LRI to have the vision to do this, the continued support and the cooperation to make it happen. Peter Lipsky, who's been a crucial partner in this. Matt Riles, who now is a graduate student at Johns Hopkins, but helped me go through all of the papers personally in the beginning and do all the scoring. So I live in Charlottesville, Virginia now. I'm a Wahoo. I have my bachelor's and master's degrees from there. I went, got my PhD at UT Southwestern. But I love this quote from Thomas Jefferson, and I think it's applicable to all of us. I like the dreams of the future better than the history of the past. Thank you very much. My daughter Kelly has lupus. As a young child, she never liked the sun. How could a kid who grew up in Jersey not want to spend summers in the Jersey Shore? She must have instinctively known even then. Her official diagnosis came in 2003 while still in college. I was still a mom in denial. Not until June 2007 when Kelly went from an overnight hospital evaluation to a 52-day stay in ICU did reality set in like a ton of bricks. Do you have that slide? Yes. Do I have to click it? There we go. And I'm reading because, you know, whenever I don't read, I tend to uh, don't need the mic. OK, because I have on a mic, don't I? <laughs> Duh. Those technical things a TV person often forgets. A coma. Doctors with specialties in every system of the body saying there's nothing they can do. Hearing the words, disconnect life support. It's not like the TV version. A few tears and it's done. It's not like Grey's Anatomy or Nashville. No. I asked God to take my life instead of hers, as doctors discussed, harvesting her organs. God won, so did we. Kelly had to learn to talk again, to walk again, wheelchair, walker, cane, rehab, and then. After two years, show the next picture, please. Oh, I have to do that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> to meet her, you never know she once had a diagnosis of death. The very next year, the Kelly Fund for Lupus Incorporated was founded. 
No longer in denial, I wanted to do all I could to educate and raise money for research. We connected with ALR when we found out all the money it raised goes to research. From that connection came LRI. We've walked together, fundraised together, sat through programs. One of the most rewarding days, I must confess, was November 16, 2010. The day that ALR made it possible for me to appear before the FDA Advisory Council. I testified in Washington and caught the train back to work in New Jersey in the afternoon the same day. When I walked in the newsroom, everyone said, congratulations. It looks like the first drug for lupus in 50 years just might get the okay. And it did a few months later. Benlista is on the market. Advocacy works. I want to be as Dr. Francis Collins, director of the National Institutes of Health, who who's labeled it last night, unashamedly advocating, making a case to tell all who will listen. At the Kelly Fund, we speak a lot to churches and communities where no one talks about lupus out loud. It is whispered still in families with shameful words like tough it out, the complainer, Horrible later labels attached to the lupus sufferer who may not understand herself what's happening to her from day to day. So how does she explain it to her parents who never lived outside their rural communities, were never educated past high school and could never afford proper health care? The Kelly Fund tries to reach that population. One way is a closed group on Facebook of people who have lupus who can discuss the impact of the disease on their lives. Before entering the group, the administrators screen them. They appreciate knowing everyone on Facebook cannot see their posts, only their lupus family. Many don't want family to know. Oops. One point Dr. Collins made that resonated with me was, how healthcare provides once prescribed medicine according to average. We who deal with lupus every day know this, there's nothing average about lupus. Oh, thank you. As all of Kelly's doctors believe that she lay dying, one resident was left to care for her. She later made a presentation before her colleagues at Mount Sinai, thank you so much, and Inglewood Hospital and ask us to attend. She spoke on the importance of treating each patient as an individual, especially with lupus. Steroids is not always the first cure-all. It's not over until God says it's over. I have a new resolve and I believe I got it just this week. Dr. Bill Paul, who founded this forum, has been described in loving and glowing terms because of his generosity and leadership. I personally plan to remind patients that there are heroes like him who work tirelessly to literally save their lives. The reason we talked about this being a mom story is because I wrote a book called A Mom Story. It's just full of tweets that I wrote and continue to write every day. I have two Facebook sites that I use as inspiration. One is the Kelly Fund for Lupus, and the, the other is the Brenda Blackman personal page. And these are just pictures I took around the country in daily tweets. We sell the books, and every dime raised goes toward research. It used to be research dollars for ALR, and now it's research dollars for ALR and LRI. Because we believe in advocacy, education, and that the money to fund more research will give us hope and will give us a cure. Thank you. So everyone heard her introduced, but Kathleen, I want you to tell everyone how you would introduce yourself. Bright. <laughs> I like color. Bright, beautiful, but you do so much more. Now, when we talk about advocacy, this is advocate number one. So. I was struck down in my prime of life, just like Kelly. Um, I've been sick since childhood. You know the symptoms. I don't I'm preaching to the choir here. You know, one day you can't get out of bed, everything hurts. You go in the sun, the next day you don't can't raise your arms above your hair head, you can't braid your hair or comb your hair. 
you look normal, everybody tells you you're a hypochondriac, a malingerer, you want attention, it's an anxiety disorder, you need to see a shrink. You get every infection that goes around. And uh, for me, I also crave water. From the time I was a baby, my mother would get me out of a crib and my eyes would be stuck shut. What we know now is that Sjogren's syndrome, which is a sister autoimmune disease of lupus. And I also always had cold hands and feet. And my father always said, cold hands, cold feet, warm heart. And I have a big heart. It wasn't until I was also in college that I got incredibly ill. I went to a Beach Boys concert and was out in the sun for eight hours. The next day, I couldn't get out of bed. Horrible headache, couldn't see out of one eye. And I was in rural upstate New York, which is where I'm from, and there were no rheumatologists. But my grandmother had died of a disease called scleroderma the year before. And genetically, she was a redhead, Irish background, and very similar to me. A lot of digestive problems, and it didn't like the sun. Um, they were able to diagnose me, and that began my lupus journey. Uh, I can tell you that I have weighed 228 pounds on high-dose prednisone. I am living proof that there is life after prednisone, and you can get off it if you work closely with your physician. And that's the first part of advocacy, is being a self-advocate, being engaged and part of your treatment team. It is absolutely essential to survive when you live with any chronic disease to become as educated as possible about the condition. And I'm not talking about going on the internet and reading every silly little thing that comes along, prescribing to drinking cow milk upside down at midnight or some stupid thing like that. I'm talking about proven anecdotal research evidence and also connecting with a community. It doesn't always have to be a lupus community, but you're very blessed in this area because you have a wonderful lupus organizations to connect to, but to talk to other people who are walking the walk with you, because the people in your family don't understand what you're going through. Look at me. Do I look ill? I'm looking at all these beautiful people in the room. Very few of you look like you're ill to me. So it's like heart disease or diabetes. You don't wear your disease on your arm or your face. So it's connecting with people that know your story and can share your concerns and help you when you're feeling low. Well. We all have bad days, and there's someone that we need to talk to. So whether it's a hotline or a support group or an online chat or a Facebook page or a Twitter community, whatever it is, that's self-advocacy. Number two is being part of your treatment team. You have to be engaged in your own health care. And it may take you years to find the right physician or health care provider that you connect to. It took me 20 years before I ended up where I am now, where I am absolutely part of my treatment team, as is my husband. No medical decision is made on my behalf without me having either a conference call or a conference table conversation with several of my specialists. And that's the way healthcare should be. We should be equal stakeholders at the table in the decision-making process. And don't let anybody else tell you otherwise, because it's your disease, and you have to learn to live with it for the rest of your life. So very, very important to be part of your treatment team and to self-advocate. Now you mentioned a lot about your own personal advocacy. So how did you become a national spokesperson in terms of uh, national lupus and autoimmune advocate? Well, lupus took everything from me. It took my hopes, my dreams, my aspirations. I wanted to go to Europe. I was a language major. I wanted to fall in love with the prince and live the life of a romance character. But that didn't happen. I was dropped from um, the study group that I had signed up for at college. And all of a sudden, as I was weighing a lot more. I was on captain of the women's rugby team. I ran. I played soccer. And all those things were taken away from me. Because back then, they told you, no exercise. Exercise is the worst thing for lupus patients. And we know that that's absolutely not true today, that the best thing you can do is exercise in moderation to move to get off your feet, especially if you're on something like steroids or prednisone where it's really hard not to gain the weight no matter what you do. So I then had to not go out anymore. And here I am in college, very sociable, 
and they say you're, you take immune compromising drugs and you don't want to be exposed to germs. So no social activities whatsoever. So try to go to college with no social activities <laughs> and no exercise, no extracurricular activities. It's, and then they told my parents I probably wouldn't be alive in five years. So that was terrifying for them. And back then, that's what they said. You would get kidney disease and probably die within five years. It's not like that anymore. And as you can see, I've survived. But I wanted to give back to the community that had given so much to me. I connected to other lupus patients and support group. And I felt like a lot of them came to me for advice. And I had a voice. And my rheumatologist recognized this and suggested that I go to Capitol Hill with the American College of Rheumatology with a bunch of doctors and some other patients who had scleroderma, or rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome. And I went to the Hill, and it was the most amazing experience of my life. I had a voice. Now, are you suggesting that, you know, the people here, well, here get in a car this afternoon and drive to Washington? No, I'm suggesting that you consider being an advocate. It is a powerful experience to go meet, whether it's with your state legislator, a county legislator, a department of health official, a public official, or your federal legislator, um, to write a letter or to make your voice heard. It gives you so much power to feel like you have a voice and someone is listening, and that that voice can make a difference. But in order to advocate, you must know a few things, and you all know these things because it's you. You must know your data. You hear the word data all the time. You must know your numbers, and we all know our numbers. But when you're an advocate, your numbers have to be streamlined to get the attention. So be of informed. Officials. Be informed. Mm -hmm. Know your numbers. For example, how many diseases you may have, how many drugs you take, what your health care costs are, either monthly or annually, and anything outrageous like I'm waiting for a kidney transplant, or I'm on dialysis, or I have a port, or whatever it is that's compelling enough to get their attention. Um, how much are your health care costs? I take 38 drugs a day. My health care costs are $158,000 a year. I have a poor, I'm infused every two weeks for seven hours at a time, and I'm blind in my right eye and have a $10,000 device. Those are numbers that are impactful and make legislators listen to understand the cost and burden of a disease of lupus. And if you don't know, for instance, everyone in your legislative district, if you know you can't get an interview with the senator, does that mean you cannot talk to legislative committees? Does that mean you cannot meet with someone on Capitol Hill who can at least hear what you have to if say? If you are a constituent, which means that you live in someone's district, and you are making a trip to Washington, or you want to meet with them locally in their local legislative office, you just call or email their scheduler, and you make an appointment. And you will, as a constituent, have a meeting with someone in that office. I know that we have a very wonderful advocacy day in March every year through the Lupus Research Institute and now the Alliance for Lupus Research. And we bring uh, people affected by lupus, whether directly or family members, to Capitol Hill, and we have a wonderful event each year where you go around the hill and you meet with your legislators and you talk to them, you tell them your story, and you tell them what you want. Usually we want increased NIH funding, as Dr. Collins told us last night. Um, the NIH budget has been cut for many years, and we need federal funding for research. And there are lupus programs and lupus bills that we advocate for as well. And of course, the FDA also has a voice. And you have a voice with, at the FDA. Tell us about that. So as you heard Brenda say that the highlight of, one of the highlights of her life um, was going and testifying before the FDA advisory panel in 2010 on a potential new treatment, Ben Lista, the first biologic for lupus. And for 12 years, the lupus community went to the FDA and asked them to have a voice on the federal advisory panel. They had arthritis patients and not lupus patients. And a lot of us applied for it. And I was very lucky to be chosen five and a half years ago. And I am the lupus patient rep at the FDA. And I actually have a vote when new lupus drugs come up before the panel. So I was actually sitting there across the table when you testified. And that day was a wonderful day, as anyone who was there can tell you. I know Peggy was there. Um, there were over 300 people 
we had three straight hours of testimony from lupus patients and patient advocacy leaders. And it was so amazing to see the entire lupus community come together on behalf of the patient to try to get the first new treatment in 56 years. And it was wonderful to be part of that process. And anyone in this room can apply to give testimony at the FDA or on other issues that are important. And uh, we put those up on our website when they're current. Um, and there, you have usually have 60 days to give public comment, and you usually just have to write your story down, and you submit it electronically, or you can fax it in. And it's a wonderful way to feel like you're making a difference in part of the process and the solution. What's been perhaps the most rewarding part of being an advocate for you? Well, I guess I can tell you the story of a congressman. The second time I ever went to the Hill, it's very intimidating when you meet with a congressman when you think how powerful they are, or a senator. And I sat there, and you, you get emotional because you tell them what lupus has done to you, and it's very emotional to tell your journey. And I always like to say that I represent 51 million other Americans who have autoimmune disease, and the 1.5 million lupus patients, my lupus warriors, as I call them. But I was telling him my story, and I said, I, I know now that I could have been a doctor, I could have been a lawyer, I could have been a politician, or even a judge. But lupus took that from me. I'll never be a mother, a grandmother, or ever have a career or financial security. I'm disabled. And I said, so there's so many things I could have done with my life. And he actually got down on his knee next to me, and he put his arm around me, and he said, my dear, you are doing so much more with your life than anybody else I've ever met. And what you do makes such a difference to the community. You're changing health care. You're making your voice heard. So just keep on advocating, because that's what you were born to do. So thank you very much. And that always stays with me whenever I'm telling my story to someone, is that you are making a difference by telling your story. And each time you tell it, you get a little better at it. You get better with your numbers and more impactful with it, and you learn what the buttons are that make people listen to you. But it's so important to tell about your lupus journey. And she is all of us, don't you think? Yeah. So I just wanted to um, end my part um, with a poem that I wrote years ago. My best friend was diagnosed with lupus at that time, 18 years ago. She was the first lupus patient in the world to have a double lung transplant. And then because of the anti-rejection medication, three years later, she had an open heart transplant. And she was just a medical miracle. She lived for um, 17 years before passing away, which was unheard of. And I wrote this poem for her. But when she passed, she told me that I was to give it to the entire lupus community. So I give it to all of you. The butterfly symbolizes heroism in its continued survival against enormous odds from its incredible transformation and rebirth to its amazing existence despite facing great opposition. This fragile creature is the embodiment of hope. Like the butterfly, the lupus patient continues to survive in a complex world, triumphing over each adversity every day with tremendous grace, dignity, and courage. And that is all of you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be an advocate for you. Thank you all so very much for being so supportive and caring and understanding because I feel like I have a closeness to each and every single one of you because I think I may sound very selfish to say this, as tough as it is to be a, someone who has lupus, it is also especially tough being someone who supports and loves and cares someone who about someone who has lupus, because we are the ones who have to watch you suffer and go through it. And there's nothing we can do except be supportive and love and care for you. You get the drugs and you get the things that can help you. And there's nothing that can help us except to see you finally, we hope, get a cure. Thank you. <laughs>